Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on relapse of Clapfoot uh, during COVID-19. Let's wait a few seconds until all participants can log in. Uh, in the meantime, a bit of housekeeping for those of you that have not been on a Zoom webinar before. At the bottom of the screen, you should see some options. Your videos um, are not working, so do not worry about trying to uh, switch that option off. You are all muted as well. Um, throughout the webinar, you can submit your questions. We're going to answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but if you can see at the bottom of the screen, you have an option that says Q&A. That's your way to submit your questions. Could I please ask you to uh, send a message so that I know that it's working through the Q&A? Perfect. Thank you. I can see. I can see some of you already sending through messages. Thank you, Martina. Thank you, Theresa. Amy, thank you very much. As I said before, we're going to answer those questions at, at the end of uh, the webinar. There are some questions that are, are quite specific, and um, those questions, what we will try to do is to uh, answer them individually after the webinar, and this is the method that we're going to use. What we're trying to do today is to give a kind of an overall understanding of uh, the signs of relapse, and what one should do uh, in order to manage relapse. And, the webinar is specifically designed for, for families um, going through uh, treatment of, of clubfoot. Um, without further ado, let me introduce uh, myself. My name is Lorena Nagwich Wyatt, and I'm the Managing uh, Director of Step Charity Worldwide. And I'm pleased to welcome this morning uh, Denise with us. Thank you, Denise. Oh, hello. I'm Denise Watson. I'm an advanced practice physiotherapist at Chelsea and Westminster NHS Trust in London. And uh, I'm a specialist in treating clubfoot and run our, our clubfoot service there. I've been treating clubfoot for um, more than 30 years. A lot of experience there, Denise. <laughs> Thank you for uh, accepting our invitation um, as a panel. Thank you. Um, so let's then... Um, share the presentation two seconds oh thanks laura donna so um i thought what we do is just start by talking about what relapse is um and um, oh we've just lost the screen laura we donna. just lost the screen let me bring it up again Sometimes we do have some technical issues. Okay, if you can go on to the next slide, Laura Donna, that would be lovely. Of course. So I thought we'd talk about uh, what relapse is, and I've got some pictures and some examples. So um, the relapse really is when you have a club foot that has been through its treatment phase. So it's had its casting and probable tenotomy, and it's gone into the bracing and then there's a return of any of the elements of the original club foot deformity. So um, uh, in technical terms, that is cavus, adductus, varus and equinus. But in, in sort of layman's terms, that's uh, maybe the heel not being able to get flat on the floor due to tightness in the Achilles tendon and the calf complex. Um, it could be the heel turning in. It could be the front of the foot curving inwards and it could be the arch of the foot increasing with that turn in. Now, um, you could have one or two of those elements or all of those elements, but a relapse is defined as a return of any of those elements uh, with, of, of the original club foot deformity. Okay, next slide, please. Did it. Seem to be having some technical issues this morning with Zoom. Okay, so there are different types, just while we're waiting for that slide to come up. Mm -hmm. There are different types of relapse. Um, so you can get uh, relapse during the different phases of treatment. So there's relapse that you get during the bracing period. So that's when the child is really still under five, uh, still in their foot abduction brace, and you get a relapse during that period of time. Or there may be you get a relapse after the bracing has finished um, as the child gets older uh, and it becomes uh, more apparent as the as the child becomes more active and, and older. And as well as that, you can have a relapse that is uh, quite stiff and 
uh, and or fixed relapse. So it's not fully flexible. You can't take the foot through full range of movement. It's actually become stiff. Or you can have a relapse where you can passively move the foot completely normally. But when the child is walking, uh, the foot turns in and that's called a dynamic relapse. And that classically, you tend to see a, a little flick up of the front part of the foot, which uh, progresses through to some deformity coming into the back part of the foot. But it's uh, that foot is remains mobile, but you can see when the child's walking as they strike the foot, uh, the front part of the foot lifts up and they tend to take the weight on the outside of the foot slightly. I'm afraid uh, the uh, presentation does not want can to we, work. Can we restart it, Loredana, and see whether it will just, because I've got some nice photographs. I, I know, I know. So what I'm going <laughs> to do, I'm going to stop sharing it. <laughs> I'm going to try again. Must be Zoom that didn't have breakfast this morning. <laughs> let's try again. Let's try again. So let's see whether it moves on to the next one. Oh, Yes. Can everybody see it now yeah. there? Yes. There we are. Perfect. So here we are. So this is, so there's, there's the early relapse, which is uh, sort of during the bracing period and then slightly later relapse. Yes. And then if we go through to the next slide, Loredana. Okay. So this is some pictures of a, a feet which are showing sort of mild signs of relapse sort of quite early on. This child is a walking child. Um, probably this is still within the bracing period. Um, but what you can see here, um, on there's relapse a little bit on both sides, but on the left side, um, you can see at the front part of the foot that uh, left big toe is starting to pull in a little bit more. And there's a little bit of hint of um, a more of a curve or an arch on that left foot, isn't there? And then if we look from the back on the uh, left side again, the heel is rotating inwards as the child stands. The, the heel comes flat onto the, onto the floor, but, uh, but it's just rotating inwards. So that's, a, uh, that's an early sign of relapse. Now, probably this foot would be fully flexible passively. If you're going to move it, it would probably go through full range of movement. Just when the child's standing and starting to use the foot, um, you're seeing these signs of relapse. Next. Okay, so you know, this is a more severe picture of a child uh, with, with relapse. Um, and the most common cause of relapse by far and away is not wearing the bracing for uh, the first five years. So uh, the, the normal, the Ponsetti uh, procedure for bracing is the braces are worn for 23 hours a day for the first three months. And then they're worn for night times and naps until five years of age, four to five years of age. It's, it's the age is, 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 has crept up and there are even some centers that are starting to use the bracing a bit later. There's no real evidence for doing that at the moment, but there may be. But certainly, um, Professor Ponsetti himself increased the age from uh, three to, to four to five. Um, so 23 hours a day for three months and then night times and naps until uh, we're saying now five years of age. So not wearing the braces is by far and away the most common cause. Um, must there might also be some muscle imbalance so one of the reasons you tend to get uh, relapse uh, after the bracing is finished even if you've had a really well corrected foot is there might be an imbalance between the muscles on the inside of the foot and on the outside of the foot so um, the muscles that pull the foot up that way are tighter and thicker and stronger than the muscles that pull the foot up that way all right, which are thinner and weaker. And so they just get overpowered by the muscles pulling the foot up on the inside. So that's called the perineal muscle, muscle group on the outside that pull the foot up and out. Uh, another common cause for relapse is that the foot hasn't been fully corrected in the original correction phase. OK, so uh, a classic is that the, the uh, tenotomy hasn't been uh, completed or there's been no tenotomy done and so there's a relapse because the heel isn't fully descended and then uh, the foot is not able to uh, sit in the boot so well the boots aren't so well tolerated and then there's a relapse because of that and then there is also this big group that have another underlying diagnosis which may not have been obvious when they were little may have been obvious and these are not idiopathic club feet so these are feet 
uh, either the children, our children have syndromes or they have a neuromuscular condition or um, an underlying uh, nerve condition that affects the way in which the lower limb works and as I say, this may become more obvious as the child gets older. We, we may have known about it from birth, but there's, this is a complete, much bigger group and it's not, they're not idiopathic club feet. Next. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, so we know that in an idiopathic club foot, and it's really important, again, we differentiate between children who have club foot and no other underlying conditions. Um, 15 to 20% of those who are compliant with their bracing will have some form of relapse and may require a tibialis anterior tendon transfer. And that was documented in Professor Ponsetti's first work and has, has been shown by quite a lot of, a lot of studies um, following up and that hasn't really changed. So if you get a good correction on the foot, you wear the foot abduction brace really religiously, uh, the rate of needing tendon transfer or therefore indicating relapse uh, is um, about 15 to 20 percent. Now, there have been there's been some work recently looking at non-compliance with foot abduction brace, and this suggests that up to 60 percent of relapse occurs in in children who are non-compliant with their foot abduction bracing, um, and that's a huge, huge, um, huge number. We know there's a higher relapse rate in the non-idiopathic feet or the syndromic feet. We know that. So um, these are even more important feet to keep well braced and keep range of movement, but we know there's going to be a high relapse rate in that group. Um, this is a picture of a child on the right who's had a relapse basically from a not wearing foot abduction brace. So it was a uh, corrected as a baby and then never really wore the foot abduction brace and pitched up at four years of age well, with uh, this appearance. And this, this shows you, you, we've talked about the elements of the original club foot deformity. You can see he can get his heel on the ground, although actually on palpation it was a little bit soft, but the front part of the foot turns in, he's got an increased arch to the foot. And actually what you can, what, if you could see the back of this foot, you'd see that the heel is also rolling in. So this, is, this has got three out of four of the elements of that original club foot deformity. Okay, next slide. So uh, what are the treatment options? So if the relapse happens early during the bracing stage, um, then recasting is an option. Recasting and then reintroducing the bracing. So, uh, so the emphasis when the child is under four years of age really will be, or certainly under three, will be um, to uh, recast and try and reintroduce the bracing. Three is about the youngest that most people do tendon transfers just because uh, you need, um, the, the bone is quite soft and cartilaginous before that. It's very difficult to be specific about the bone that you're putting the tendon into before then. Um, so uh, if the, if the uh, relapse happens early, then you would look at recasting, maybe re -tenotomy, if a tenotomy or if a tenotomy hasn't been done, looking at doing a late tenotomy and then reintroducing the bracing. That would be, that would be the, the, the normal uh, first port of call with relapse in the early stages. If there's a relapse once the bracing has finished, Recasting may still be an option depending on where the deformity is, um, but also moving to tendon transfer. There may be, especially if it's a not an idiopathic foot, you maybe look would look at orthotics to try and manage the foot. And there are other surgical procedures, but with a foot like this in a later relapse, particularly if it's not an idiopathic foot, then you're coming out of the boundaries of Ponsetti management anyway. Um, and um, you know, I'm not going to go into the very specific options in terms of other surgery because that is so condition specific and every foot is different. So, um, but in, in the late relapses, you're definitely looking at uh, recasting as an option, tendon transfer, um, probably better to do a tendon transfer earlier than later. So if you, if um, recasting continuously in an idiopathic foot is probably, um, it can mask the fact that you need a tendon transfer and sometimes it's better to just get on and do that because it's going to balance the foot more effectively. I'm sure there'll be questions about this. Indeed. Okay. 
So if you're in the situation at the moment where you can't access treatment for the time being, let's hope it's not for too long. What are you going to do while you're waiting to get back into your team? I mean, certainly I know that, you know, I'm compiling a list of children. I know who've got relapse that I need to recast when our clinics reopen. And I've got about 12 children sitting on that list now. So what can you do in the meantime? Um, stretch is really important. So if you can do, if you can get your child doing effective calf stretches and Hopefully you've been shown these by a physiotherapist. There are lots and lots of different types of, uh, of, of calf stretches. Um, then you, you definitely want to carry on with all your stretches around the foot and keep the foot as supple and mobile as possible. I think what people forget is that general fitness is really important. So you want to keep all the muscle groups strong, particularly around your core, particularly the upper leg muscles. Um, but doing them in a low impact way is the best way I and mean, there are some really good online uh, resources available at the moment joe wicks is fantastic if uh, you and your children are fit enough to do it uh, but um cycling swimming yoga obviously swimming's very difficult at the moment because you can't get out but uh, cycling cycling's a possibility if that's if you've got access to uh, somewhere where you can social distance and cycle and uh, yoga and there's good online resources for children's yoga. There's some really good stretches and strengthening um, with that. You probably have been given some specific physiotherapy exercises and uh, these will include things like hopping, walking on your heels, lifting the foot, of, foot from the floor, standing on one leg, balancing exercises, maybe uh, using those TheraBand elastic bands to uh, work the muscles on the outside of the foot that pull the foot up and out. Um, and it might be worth contacting your local physiotherapy department about uh, whether they can send you a sheet of specific exercises. The most important thing I'd say is if you think your child is having a relapse and you're waiting to start treatment is you do not stop bracing, all right? So you keep bracing if you possibly can, um, because as, when you stop bracing, you're going to have more, more chance of, of relapse. So if you're still in that uh, bracing phase, you want to keep going with it, whereas if at all possible. Thank you, Denise. That was a very um, good presentation. A lot that <laughs> has been discussed, and I'm certain that uh, many people have many questions that they want to ask you. Um, so for those of you that are attending, uh, now this is um, the part where we're going to answer your questions. As I said before, at the uh, bottom of your screen, you should have the Q&A section. You can submit your questions um, through that option. Uh, those of you that I forgot to mention before are joining us only by the phone. You can submit your question to info at steps-charity.org.uk. So, uh, Denise, uh, first question that has come in, um, which you referred to previously, is um, how long do you carry on recasting? So are there any statistics out there or any research done to assess how long you should carry on recasting? Well, I think, I think the general consensus is, is is that if you have an imbalance in the muscles around the foot, so the muscles on the inside of the foot work much harder than the ones on the outside. So the, again, those ones that pull the foot up and in that way are working much harder than the ones that pull the foot up and out that way. You're probably better off doing your tendon transfer slightly earlier than later. So um, I would say that the classic is to get to the end with the, with some with a family that have been very compliant with the bracing. They get through to five. They stop the bracing, and within that first year, if you're going to see a relapse, you tend to see it within that first six months to a year. And at that stage, if you see that coming through, but you can still passively move the foot, you're probably better off getting on and doing a tendon transfer at that stage. So. Um, I personally wouldn't keep recasting because you're going to get a better result in a younger child. I think they rehab quicker. Um, it's not got so much such strong implications for coming out of school for a few weeks. Um, you know, they, they just respond better to the tendon transfer. And you've got a much smaller child to be uh, immobile for a while because it's normally four to six weeks of non-weight bearing after a tendon transfer and if you're trying to do that on a nine-year-old they're very big and heavy if you're doing that on a five-year-old it's a much it's much easier for the family to cope with so for, for all those practical reasons 
probably better not to keep recasting because if you know that you've got muscle imbalance there, it's unlikely to change. Thank you, Denise. And with regards to um, tendon transfer, we do have a questions um, whereby um, a child has had tendon transfer, but the foot relapses again. Why does it happen? Okay, so this is always really disappointing as a clinician when you've done a tendon transfer and you have a relapse. Um, so the first thing, um, there are a few things to look at. First of all, to check that the tendon transfer is still working effectively. All right, so that's the first thing. And that might involve checking that the tendon is, uh, is still uh, implanted into the, uh, into the bone it's been put into and also checking that it is activating. I'd also say that a lot of cases a little bit more investigation is needed because it may be that there's an underlying condition which hasn't been considered previously. Um, and so you may need to think about doing some uh, nerve conduction studies or um, even doing some scans to just check that there's nothing else going on either in the spine or that there's not an underlying neuromuscular cause. Um, but it is possible to recast a, a, a foot that has had a tendon transfer. And then you may, might want to think about some additional orthotic support to try and support that foot. Thank you, Denise. And um, for a child that has had a tendon transfer, uh, what exercises should a uh, parent encourage the child to do with, with the foot? Well, hopefully you'll have been given some post-operative instructions about uh, exercises, but these would include things like um, active uh, exercises to pull the foot up and out and, and maybe using some of that TheraBand resistance band to, to help with that. Lots of things like single leg standing, starting to do some hopping, um, calf building exercises and stretches. So you, you, calf exercise where you stand on the edge of a step come up onto tiptoe and then lower the heel very slowly down below the edge of the step is a great exercise for building up the calf muscle that can be done a bit later after tendon transfer. And I think a lot of people forget general fitness after tendon transfer, that actually all the core muscles and the bottom muscles and the, the thigh muscles need to be strong. And so some rehab of those and your local physiotherapy team will definitely be able to, to give advice on core exercises. Thank you, Denise. Um, we do have a question with regards to um, um, uh, wearing special shoes if a child um, had a relapse. Do we need to wear special shoes? I, I, don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's always important to wear good supportive shoes if you've uh, had a club foot. And in fact, <laughs> to that point, all children should really wear good supportive shoes, but um, I don't think it's very rare to need special shoes. And in fact, some of the special shoes are actually really heavy and very restrictive for the child. So good supportive shoes that have a nice firm heel. So the heel doesn't sort of completely collapse when you press it. Do up uh, quite high fastening. So with either Velcro or laces. So things like slip on shoes or neoprene sandals, they're not great for or Ugg boots, not great for a child. You want, you want a nice, well-fitting trainer or shoe that has a uh, nice firm heel and is high fastening and supports the footwell. But you don't need special footwear. It's very really fair too. And uh, with regards to signs, um, there's a matter that I would like to understand if um, um, basically her son bears his weight on the outside of the foot and if this is a sign of relapse. Yeah, so that often is a sign of relapse. That's often, that's often um, uh, one of the signs. And if that's happening, you'll probably see that the heel is rotating inwards as well. So, so one, of the, one of the early signs of relapse is that the front of the foot starts to pull up when, when you step, and then you'll take the weight on the outside of the foot. Uh, but then quite often when they're standing, they're back down onto flat feet again. That's a dynamic one. In a, in a more fixed uh, relapse, the child will tend to take weight on the outside of the foot. But there are, you know, this is why it needs to be assessed really, because there are some children that do tend to roll a little bit when they're sort of two or three years of age and they're a little bit bow-legged. Um, then sometimes they'll stand a little bit on the outside of the foot and that's completely normal. So it really needs to be, to be um, to be assessed, but 
if the child, when they're walking, is taking weight on the outside of the foot and the heel is also rolling inwards, like I showed in a couple of those pictures, then that suggests to me that that's likely to be a bit of a rebound. Thank you, Denise. Uh, there are some uh, interesting questions also coming from, from the uh, Q&A section. Um, uh, one is related to um, how often would you need to not wear the brace for the foot to start to relapse? So uh, when does the foot tend to relapse? At what point when you don't wear the... the uh, okay, so I think I, I look at bracing a bit like if, um, if you've ever had orthodontic work once the braces come off, you have to wear a retainer. And if you don't wear the retainer, your teeth go back into the old position and the body has a real memory for its original position. Um, so in some children, when they don't wear the brace, it takes several months to get a relapse. I've seen other children where they've been out of their, out of their brace for two weeks and they've got a relapse. So it does vary from child to child. But the main problem of coming out of the boots is that you then have a battle to get the child back into them. And it, the boots and bar, if, they, you know, if it's an everyday occurrence and the child knows it's part of routine, they tend to tolerate them very well. If they know that they can have a bit of time in and a bit of time out, they're all, always going to opt for the time out. So it's more about, I think it's more important to think about the bracing as being a part of routine. It's like brushing your teeth. If you stop brushing your children's teeth for two weeks, and you start trying to brush their teeth again, they're not going to like it. <laughs> Understood, Denise. Um, there's an interesting question. Um, why then, um, I guess, uh, who has defined it uh, stopping at a certain age uh, would give the best result? So I guess this is uh, effectively talking about the research that was done by Professor Ponseri or Dr. Ponseri, obviously, as to uh, up until what age you should wear uh, the braces? Oh, Not I mean, there is still, the relapse. <laughs> there's still so much controversy about this. Um, I think everybody, I think everybody in the sort of club foot world has agreed really that four to five years is a minimum. Um, and there, as I say, there are some centres looking at uh, keeping the kids in boots and bars for longer. Now, I think. Uh, personally my take on this is a sort of pragmatic approach is that uh, this is uh, children do have a bit of free will here so if you've got a child that's taking their boots and bars off every night and they're sort of they're, they're over four years of age and they remove their boots and bar every night personally it there's very little you're going to be able to do about that However, if you've got a child who's five and is completely happy about wearing their foot abduction brace and doesn't want to stop why stop? So I, I think there has to be a little bit of, uh, uh, of a pragmatic approach rather than saying every child needs to wear it until they're five years, three months of age, or you know, it's going to vary a little bit from child to child. But I think everybody's in agreement from looking at relapse. Professor Ponsetti started kids wearing it to two, then he upped it to three, and then he upped it to, f to five. So uh, I think it's really important that um, you carry on with the bracing for as long as the child's tolerating it well. Thank you. Um, I can see uh, also a lot of questions with regard to uh, children relapsing several times and, and having a bit of an understanding how, how, how this can be and what is the best way forward for them. I know we talked about it again, but probably if we can reassure Paris on 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 what can be done if a child relapses. Okay, so 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 my first question is why why are uh, why is the child continuing to relapse? So is there something else? Is this 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 is this an idiopathic foot? Is there another condition going on that hasn't been uh, hasn't been diagnosed yet? Or is if it is as I say syndromic or um, complex feet? We know that they are more likely to relapse and there's, pro there's an underlying cause for that. But in an idiopathic foot that keeps relapsing, is this an indication that actually tendon transfer is required and it needs to be done? Is it that the bracing just isn't getting well enough established, that they're not spending enough hours overnight in it? So maybe they're only spending four or five hours a night in the bracing and it needs to be 12. So it's not quite enough. Or, you know, you look at, look at, the other the causes really for why that foot keeps relapsing thank you denise um i think that was it in terms of the questions there are a few that have been submitted that um, um 
we are going to answer uh, directly to the participants. Uh, those of you that have further questions, could you please either send them to me? You will receive an email. You should have received already my email. And it's uh, loredana at steps-charity.org.uk. Um, and uh, we're going to uh, respond to them individually. Uh, also, I appreciate the fact that many have, of you have further questions. Um, we will therefore try to um, organize a webinar uh, on, on relapse again, specifically probably discussing atypical clapfoot, syndromic clapfoot. Um, therefore, please uh, follow us on social media to see when we're going to uh, announce the, the, the next webinar. Denise, again, thank you very much. For yeah, your... ju and, and just to say, I think the one thing we haven't probably said, it, it's difficult at the moment because of the COVID-19 situation um, where face-to-face um, -face consultations aren't being done in most hospitals. But I think the important thing is to try and stay in contact with the, your treating team um, so that they, most teams are compiling a list um, and then they're going to have to prioritise once they start treating again. Um, and I think so it's, it's, it's about staying in touch with your local team and making sure that they know, maybe sending them some clinical pictures that they can see what the situation is um, and uh, keeping in contact so that they can start treatment again as soon as they're possibly able. None of us like it. All of us want to get on and treat again. No, indeed, Denise. And I think you, you made a, a very good point in that if, if, if there, if, parents speak sign of relapse is what they need to do is obviously contact their medical team ensuring that uh, the child is seen as soon as possible uh, there is going to be unfortunately we'll recognize the fact there's going to be a backlog because of uh, the fact that clinics have been shut therefore clinicians have to uh, set up priorities list of children that they have to be mm -hmm. seen as soon as possible um, therefore if you feel that there is an urgent need for you to see a um, clinician as soon as the, um, the hospitals are open as Denise has mentioned, please do get in contact with them, send photos so they can do a pre-assessment uh, via online videos or calls. Uh, obviously not everybody is able to have Zoom sessions. Uh, and also we are aware that some of you cannot get a hold of their clinicians. If that is the case, again, please do contact us and we'll do our best to see what we can do to support you. Thank you everybody. And thank you Denise for your time. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.